And now, Jalen and Jacoby. Welcome to the Jalen Jacoby After Show presented by State Farm. Jalen, I'm reeling every week. It just ends on a cliffhanger, and I want to watch the next episode. This week ended with your Pacers facing off against Michael Jordan. Reggie Miller saying that he was going to retire Michael Jordan. What would it feel like to be around that energy? So it's um when you watch like your past, but it doesn't end the way you want it to end, it's a little weird watching it 25, 30 years later. Mm. Because the world gets a chance to appreciate and celebrate and acknowledge the greatness of Michael Jordan and going six and no in the finals and winning finals MVP each time and Phil Jackson and Scottie Pippen's top 50 and Dennis Rodman having sex with Carmen Electra in the practice facility. And the world gets a chance to appreciate that. But back in the day, Jacoby, when you play your division opponents so many times during a regular season and you play against a team in the playoffs we faced them 11 times that year 11 so after 10 games we were five and five so to the rest of the world we're about to celebrate mj to us we're about to end mj's legacy and to get a lead in the first quarter by double digits, to get a lead in the fourth quarter by single digits and lose the game. I'm excited that we're going to have Jason on and glad we've given the people what they want and create quality content. But I'm not enthusiastic right now. I mean, you sound emotional about this, and we haven't even gotten to you guys losing it. Some tells yeah. me that'll be next week's discussion. <laughs> like we always do at this time, it is time we bring in the director of The Last Dance and our friend, Jason Ayer. Jason, welcome back to Jalen Jacoby, The After Show. I want to start with you in Episode 7, where Episode 7 started with a gentleman by the name of Jerry Krause. And he started this episode with him saying, there's no backstabbing going on. Almost almost disrespected <laughs> by the question. What was the decision making to start this episode that way? We had that piece of footage um, from the very outset two years ago when we were going through all this. I think you hear that audio actually in the opening animation of the show. There's no mm -hmm. backstabbing going on here. Um, and as soon as I saw it, I said, when is that from? Because I knew that chronologically we wanted to hold it until that moment in the 97-98 in the season came up, which turned out to be the beginning. It was actually literally on the eve of the playoffs that they, they held that press conference. So we ended episode six, uh, cliffhanging the beginning of the playoffs, and we figured we'd kick it off there. I also loved the kicker at the end of it, the way to go, Craig. Um, <laughs> I just thought it was a great way to do that. And that's Craig Sager, rest in peace, his voice. Uh, but our editor found that. I saw that clip and never noticed that i just noticed jerry walking off and inevitably there was someone in the edit room and i'd be like oh well, what do you think of that and we discussed like what it was until our editor devin Kincannon was sitting in an edit room by himself he then cut that sequence showed it to me and he had that subtitle in there and we all died laughing and um there are a couple of the partners <laughs> who actually wanted to take that out which i thought was sacrilege and, and we ended up winning that fight and we kept it in and you're going deeper into the box score and one of the relationships that you highlighted was the one between Michael Jordan and his father. As somebody that never met his biological father, why was it so very important to you to make sure that that played heavily in these episodes? Um, you mean you never met your biological father, you're saying? Mm -hmm. okay. Correct, I never met my biological father. Got it, I know I remember from, from Fab Five. Yes, um, sir. Michael's relationship with his dad was extraordinary. Whether he was a celebrity or if he wasn't a celebrity, his dad was, was more than his dad. He was one of his best friends, if not his best friend. And, and given uh, that we showed earlier in the series, you saw in episode two, how difficult it was to get his dad's attention, to get that affection that he wanted from his dad, to get the approval he wanted from his dad, and how that drove his competitive spirit. The, the, the roots of Michael's fierce competitiveness, which we see later on in the episode, were born, the seed was planted, when Larry got more attention, his brother, than he did from his dad. So they, their arc, we tried to just kind of plant seeds throughout the series showing that his dad was always there. He was right next to him when he, when he uh, won the title in 91. 
He uh, was right there for him when he decided to do the media blackout and he spoke for him in, in 93. That was in dope. Series. Um, and then I really wanted people to understand why it was so significant. It, it was the thing that pushed Michael over the edge and actually made him leave the game of basketball. So this was not just- That was crazy. Not just the death of a father. It, it, it's the horrific death of a father amidst this maelstrom of uh, media scrutiny and you know the, the world was kind of closing in around him and then that tragedy happens to him and his family and then some irresponsible journalists want to question whether or not he was somehow responsible for such a horrible uh, for a horrific incident so um we thought it was was imperative just to, to establish just how close they were as much as we could early in the episode after watching the previous episodes about the the media pressure and the fan pressure and the experience of being michael jordan not being as fun as you would want it to be, not wanting to be like Mike, how much role do you think that that media coverage had to do with him deciding to leave the game of basketball? 100%. Um, I think that that he had, as Mark Vansel says, I think that he had decided in 1992 that he wanted to leave. But being the competitor that he is, he wanted to win three in a row because Magic Larry and Isaiah had not done so. Uh, mm -hmm. And then after that, he was done. But but inside and outside of that locker room, I think that he he had pretty much had enough and he was he was spent. Um, so then for this, this tragedy to befall his family and then to have to even answer for it. I mean, there's, we didn't have time to put all of the, the, uh, scrutiny that he was under at that point, uh, in the dock, but there were people who were saying Michael Jordan owes us an explanation. He owes <laughs> us the side of the story. He didn't owe you anything. He just went through the worst thing you can go through as a son to lose your father and best friend in, in such a violent way. So. I think he had had it at that point. And he, he always promised his dad that, that he was going to try and play baseball. He had discussed his last discussions, as he said in the doc, that his last discussions with his father were about playing baseball. So this was his way of grieving. Jason, you got a chance to sit in the room with him. How emotional was it as he told those stories? It's the most reticent that I had seen him. It's the most subdued that I had seen him in the course of the three interviews. And mm. it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it's the most human he was because I don't care who you are. You can be superhuman or you can be just Joe Smith walking down the street anonymous. If you're talking about the death of your dad and he was really close to you and you're talking about it in such a horrific way, you're going to be subdued. You're going to be reluctant to to, to and Michael, as you know, um, isn't that generous with his emotions. He, he's not uh, he's not an open book. So. He knew those questions were coming, obviously. He knows we're going to tackle these subjects uh, at some point during our interview process. Um, so I, I think it was difficult for him. It was, it was definitely, it wasn't awkward. It wasn't like this tense moment in the room. Is he gonna get up and walk out? I never thought that I was going to, I tried to, to ask those as, as considerately as I could and as respectfully as I could. Um, but you don't know. You have no idea. I, I don't know, Michael. I'm not a friend of his. So it feels really inappropriate for me to be asking him about this. So I'm, I'm almost I don't want to say I'm asking apologetically, mm. but but mm -hmm. you really have to come at it from a, a, a sensitive perspective, because right. if someone came up to him in a bar or something and asked him about this, he'd tell them, get away, you know, at least. Um, so I just felt like I needed to, it's inappropriate to be asking someone about that, but we have to do it if we're going to tell a responsible story. So it was, it was uh, delicate. Well, jumping around a little bit, just because you gave that answer um, at the end of this episode, episode seven, uh, he gets a little emotional and you mentioned earlier that he was a little concerned about how he would be portrayed and how people would feel about the way he treats his teammates. What was it like being in the room while discussing that? That was um, stunning because that only took place 45 minutes into our first interview with him. So we're 45 minutes into an eight hour, year and a half process. Oh, I, wow. I met him nine months before that um, and started kind of planting seeds for we're gonna go places that may be uncomfortable, et cetera. Um, and in my limited exposure to him, seeing how he treated me and how he treated those around him, I saw him as a nice guy. And I know that that reputation is not one that is that's not the first adjective that comes to mind when people start describing the Michael Jordan that they know from the image that's that's portrayed, you know, on television and on the internet and all that. If you Google Michael Jordan nice guy, <laughs> of, I'm serious. We, we tried this because we had discussions as this process. That's a good one. 
I'm serious. You're not going to get this plethora of stories about how nice Michael Jordan is. If you Google Michael Jordan, nice guy, you actually get the opposite of that. Um, and I was interested in dispelling that myth or, or giving him the opportunity to at least, because in my experience, he was respectful to, to everyone that he dealt with, including me and my crew. So I knew that I want, I still have the, the sheet of paper um, or the 11 sheets of paper that I went into that interview with. Uh, and I was just looking at them uh, for reference the other day. And it's on like the second page. It's early in the interview. Um, but it is, you know, is all of that intensity and all the success that you've achieved worth the cost of being perceived as a nice guy? Because by and large, in my estimation, you are not. Um, and I think you can see his expression. I think he was a little bit surprised by the question or like, he almost had this look like, well, I think I'm a nice guy. I don't know. And then <laughs> he started to get more and more intense. And by the end of that, I mean, it's 45 minutes into the first interview, he was tearing up and he had that, again, mm -hmm. that finger I told you guys about in the first time I met him, that huge finger that comes out <laughs> bends a foot and a half. You put that finger up and started to choke up and I could see a tear in the corner of his eye. And I'm thinking like, what is going on here? But it's funny if you talk about like, what are the things that elicit that kind of emotion from him showing him, his mom reading a letter home from him, so his mom's mm -hmm. voice, his mom's face, family elicits emotion from him and his philosophy, how he lives his life defending that he is so adamant about that, that he gets emotional about it. And he said he finished and he put his hand up and he said, break. And he leaned up and got out of his chair and I got up. There was a, a bathroom behind me and I, I got up too, and I didn't know where to go because I was blocked by the light. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll just go in here for a little bit and, and, and chill out. I went in there. I remember sitting there just like splashing water in my face. Like that's a moment that, that is going to be a powerful moment in this documentary. I don't know where it's going to go. We just started this process. Um, we mm -hmm. were two years from even anyone seeing where we are now, but it's just one of those moments. And that was preceded 20 minutes before that by his, his belly laugh. When I, I mentioned the traveling cocaine circus, it was like, all right, he's going to, he's going to go there. And, he's also going to go here. and those are the two places that I was afraid that he wouldn't go, that he wouldn't be candid and tell me honest stories. And then he might not be as emotional and vulnerable um, as we wanted. And he, he, checked off those two boxes in the first 45 minutes. So that's where the whole project changed after that Q and A. Well, one of the things I'm pretty sure to help that process. And before I ask my next question, something that also helped those interviews go so very well. Did this have anything to do with his performance? <laughs> huh? That's a bottle of Sincoro tequila, the, Michael Jordan's favorite tequila. Uh -huh. And the beauty about this, shout to MJ, shout to Jeannie Buss, their new business venture. The emotion from a guy who was respectfully an equal opportunity employer as it related to pushing teammates, small guys, Steve Kerr punch him, big guys, <laughs> Bill Winnington punch him. No, younger black Purdue. guy. He punched yes. Him. Yeah. What did he do with Purdue? He punched Purdue. He didn't punch Winnington. Oh, okay. Yeah. I I appreciate that. I at least thought you was going to stop me and say, well, he only punched Kerr. He no, punched no, no, some no. another tall no. white guy on the team. Yes, he did. Is, yes. is my point. And then lastly, Scotty Burrell, he's trending right now, but for all of the wrong reasons. <laughs> how, was, how, how was it getting to know him throughout this process? Scotty is a, one of the nicest guys you could possibly meet. I don't know if you know him, Jalen, but exceedingly nice guy like to the point of borderline dorkiness just such a polite nice dude um he's a coach now he coaches college ball in connecticut not at connecticut but in connecticut dope, um, dope. and also was a, a major league level pitcher as well i don't people should look up scotty burrell because scotty threw high 90s like scotty was was legit all-star level prospect in in the major leagues and, and elected to go pro after winning a national title at uconn scotty burrell is no joke he's a different human being than Michael. He's got a different DNA makeup. Um, and that was the first teammate that Michael ever mentioned the first time that I met him. 
when, mm. when I, when I said to him, um, why do you want to do this? And he said, I don't. And I said, why not? The first thing he said was we had a guy named Scotty Burrell. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I remember him saying, I MF'd him up and down the court every practice. They knew they was going to need him. They knew they was going to need him. That's what he said. He said, I needed him to be tough enough that when the playoffs came, we're in the East. And he said, he mentioned Indiana and New York, who was out of it by then. But he's just talking about the East in the 90s. Indiana, New York, and the Miamis of the East. I needed to know that I could count on him. But when you see this footage, you're going to take it out of context, et cetera, et cetera. So that's when, that was the, what started that conversation with us about how I assured him there would be context. And we talked to Scotty too. Scotty and Michael are good friends. Scotty, Scotty goes to Michael's house every summer and plays golf with him. Like they, good for Scotty. He knows tight. Michael Jordan got championship rings <laughs> yeah. playing with the Bulls. That could have been my spot. They now, <laughs> traded for me and Sean Kemp and let Scotty Pippen go in 94. That's what Cross was trying to do, Jason. Well, is that true? Yeah. Oh man, that would have been so, nice. Jill, you know I just read. Explain too? again. The, explain again the potential trade, Jill. And this is important. The night before the draft, Jason, and I want you to hear this. Jerry Krause calls me in my hotel room. I'm popping a bump underneath my left eye. I'm so focused on it. It was the biggest pimple on the big, <laughs> biggest day of my life. I couldn't believe this was happening to me. The phone ring is Jerry Krause. He's asking me questions about Chicago. Have I ever been? And you know, what do I think about coming to play there and all of that stuff? And how would I like to be a part of their legacy? And, you know, he was just letting me know. And then he's like, what do I think about Sean Kemp? And I was like, Sean Kemp? I was like, <laughs> like he's an animal, you know what I'm saying? Like, get a chance to play with him? I was like, cool. So I came in front. I went to bed the night before my draft thinking that they were going to swap picks and I was going to go to the Bulls with – Sean Kemp and Jerry Cross is going to trade Scottie Pippen. 94, when Michael Jordan was playing baseball. Wow. I wish that happened because you would have definitely been one of the teammates that Michael Jordan punched in the face during practice. <laughs> like, without question. <laughs> without question. You would have definitely been one of those teammates. Now, you want to slip that. Every Sunday night we do this, and I know that you really just want to talk about the musical selections in, in the film that you Correct. made. Correct, yes. So you were so excited about Fantastic Voyage. Like, you were so hype on Coolio. No, because, I like, yo, I mean, so that's mainstream. Like, people sleep on Coolio. It. You've been teasing it. Why were I you did so not. Hyped? I gave you a hint as to what it was. It didn't mean that I was psyched about it. And listen, all respect to Coolio. No disrespect to Coolio. Um, great rapper, great chef, great human being. <laughs> All I did was tell you that there was a West Coast gangster rapper with dreadlocks who was going to have a prominent song in episode seven. That's all I said. That was a spur of the moment. Like, we need a little bit of energy in this episode decision. Mm. Some of these things like Rakim, LL, Tribe, Outcast, I've been thinking of those songs for years that we were going to use them in those spots. Coolio was literally... Me sitting in the edit, watching the baseball section, trying to put music under it, finding nothing that really powered it along and thinking, we need something here. And literally Googling 1994, 1995 hip hop. And what's the least mm -hmm. obvious, like we're not going to, like there was, there was Domino was in there. There was, um, <laughs> there were so many songs that like just kind of didn't fit. And then Fantastic Voyage was like, all right, it's not so mainstream that it's poppy and soft. It's not so poppy and soft that it's obvious. And it's a great beat and it actually helped that. Michael's on a fantastic voyage down, down in Birmingham, trying out a new sport. Yeah, he was. And it is indelible to that era. So I was like, you know what? I'm the one who set this checklist. It checks enough of the boxes. Let's try it. And then as soon as Terry Francona speaks, that beat kicks in. And also it was, it was the clincher was, um, if you can't take the heat, get your ass up the kitchen. Was that little blonde headed kid try, trying to get the autograph with that lyric? <laughs> Michael peeling out. It was like, all right. He, this kid didn't know he was going to be in the documentary 30 years later. And he certainly didn't think he was going to be under a profane rap lyric. So let's give him a let's give him a thrill. That guy's probably 40 years old now, wherever he is. But that was that selection process. This Sunday in episode seven, we watched the story of a famous moment in Scottie Pippen's career when a final shot was drawn up for Tony Kukoc and not him, and he did not get off the bench. And it also sort of reminded me of, 
Isaiah Thomas and not shaking hands. And like these singular moments where maybe they didn't show the most, the Good best point. character or represent themselves perfectly, but they have to talk about them 30 years later. And these moments of misjudgment sort of get stamped on their character in eternity. What's it like discussing that with them in the room? And how do you think that affects their lives to this day, especially with Scotty not coming off the bench in that moment? Um, it's definitely sensitive to bring up because again, I don't know these people. And oftentimes it's the only time I'm ever going to meet them before or after that. Like I've never met Scotty before. I don't know if I'll ever, ever run into him again. I hope I do because I have the utmost respect for him and the respect he showed for us, the time he gave us. All these guys, none of these guys had to sit down. No one made a dime from this. There was like, they could have all hung up on us and we got 106 people to say yes. So That's shout dope. out to everybody for doing that. Um, with Scotty, it's difficult. I was, I came at it with a sense of curiosity because I honestly was curious, like, what would you do it again? Tell me that story from your perspective. And, and are, do you have regrets about it? Um, what was interesting about this one, and, and we had to decide how to, what to include in the edit. And because everyone defends him, Steve Kerr comes to his defense, Bill Cartwright eventually comes to his defense. And he made that famous speech in the locker room and, and uh, Bill Wennington, someone says that everybody was crying. It depends who you ask exactly mm -hmm. what went on in that closed door meeting. But clearly um, it's something that happened and made them stronger because at practice the next day, you can see that everyone's hanging out with Scotty, like nothing's wrong. They did win the game. So that helped. Uh, and, and shout out to Tony for actually making that shot. What an incredible shot. Yeah. I think that that goes, that goes missed that Tony hit that completely shot. completely different narrative too. Yeah. If he misses that shot. Oh my God, man. Like I, I still, that story is so notorious that people, hopefully not after this, it'll be a, a ubiquitous enough story that he did hit the shot and they won the game. But people say, yeah, remember when he sat out and they lost that game because he wouldn't take the shot? Like, that's how notorious that story is. Well, a lot of people mm -hmm. don't remember that they won. Then he had the famous dunk over Ewing right after that. And, and boom, again, he's like Chicago's favorite son with, with Michael out of town. Um, but he curiously said that he would do it again in the interview. Huh. As mm. you know, in the doc, he says that. And he was vague about it, but it was like, and I tried to double back on it and say, so wait, if you had it to do it over again, he said, yeah, I would have, I would have, um, how did he, he phrase it? Because he said, I, th he, I think he said, I would have stood up again, meaning like I would have stood up to them and sat down. So it was a prepositional, like confusing preposition. But for all these guys to defend him and then for him to say, I would have done the same thing. Uh, it was difficult. It was like, do we even include Scotty saying that? Do we want to, do we want to dilute what these guys are saying about him? So we ended up just putting all of it in. I asked him and I'm still curious if Michael was there, if he was in the building, not on the team, but if he was sitting behind the bench in the second row, would you have done that? Mm. And I don't, uh, he said he would have done the same thing. I'm still curious. I don't know. That's an interesting hypothetical because I think that Michael mm. cast such a shadow over that team. Michael called Phil and said, he's never going to live that down ever. And Phil was heartbroken because, wow. you know, so um, it's definitely sensitive, but it's, it's something that we look forward to telling because it's such a Michael heavy documentary at this point. We're supposed to be about all the bulls, but there's so much Michael business to get to. But we, um, we, there was a version of episode seven and eight that did not have the bulls without Michael storyline in it. Cause we had so much to get to with, uh, the murder of James Jordan and Michael's decision to leave and addressing all the conspiracy theories as much as we could, because that's something I really, really wanted to be sure that we did. My brother, Paul, is a lawyer down in Miami, and I actually went over my question <laughs> with him. Um, not that That's I'm, a vet move. I'm never going to match wits with David Stern. He's one of the, the maybe the brightest person I've ever met in my life, and, and rest in peace, David Stern. Uh, but I wanted to be sure that he couldn't verbally say later on, well, I didn't exactly say this, didn't exactly say that. So did Michael Jordan leave the NBA of his own volition in 1993? And the answer was, he said, yes, he did. So I believe him. And I think, you know, a, a lot of times, as I've said before, these conspiracy theories are way simpler than you think they are. It's fun to conjecture about it. But um, I, I believe that this guy was, was spent and grieving and needed to reset in a dozen different ways. Well, um, much like Michael Jordan left the NBA and then came back shortly after, you're about to do the same thing. Do you mind sticking around and talking to us about episode eight in a little bit? I'm going yes. to go take, go take yes. some tea. Take a few th swings, get outside, <laughs> and I'll be back.
You're watching the Jalen and Jacoby After Show presented by State Farm. And it's just so great to hear Jason talk about the making of this film and all the different interviews and all the decisions that happen behind the scenes, just getting this done and the accelerated timeline. And now that we're looking at episode eight, there's something that comes to mind is this is about Michael Jordan, but it's not just about that. It's about this era of the NBA, an era that you played in. And there are so many people. Charles Barkley came up earlier and Isaiah Thomas came up earlier and Reggie Miller came up in episode eight. There are so many players that just Michael Jordan stopped from getting championships. What did it feel like to know that there could be a big old chunky championship ring on your finger right now if it wasn't for Michael Jeffrey Jordan and you are not alone? So it's like um, Slick Rick once said it, don't hurt me again. What was that, teenage love? So, so I, I watch these and, I, I, and I'm excited to like relive the stories. Mm -hmm. But as somebody that was in the foxhole, it's like watching the games, watching the officiating, watching the coaching, the substitution patterns, the score and getting suspended for game five. It, 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 it just makes me feel a, a little, a, a little, Nause nauseated, I guess that's a word, that we didn't stop MJ from getting his second three-peat. Remember, every time you talk about him, we discuss his legacy. We always d acknowledge the fact that he had back-to-back -back three peats interrupted by the two years that he didn't play. I'm like, man, we had a chance to end that. It's, but it's not just you and Reggie Miller and those Pacers. And you think about, we saw uh, Sean Kemp and Gary Payton. We saw Charles Barkley. We saw Carl Malone. Patrick Ewing, Carl John, Malone and John, John Stockton. Stockton. Like you see all of these Hall of Fame players Drexler. that do not have rings. And there's a singular reason. And that is because there's a man named Michael Jeffrey Jordan that exists on this planet. And that is what stunted their growth and sort of hurt <laughs> their legacy. Oh, really? You going to rub it in? Really? You going to act like that? Really? Oh, yeah. Really? Really? You didn't oh, win yeah. your rec league this year. Y'all didn't win it, the championship this year. Jalen, I don't think that has the emotional impact of not winning a rec league one season when you – it gets brought up all the time. You look at Charles Barkley's media career. A lot of people didn't know what a great player he was. They just know that he gets ribbed by Shaq for not winning a ring. And there's so much focus in our society on winning a championship, winning a championship. And Michael Jordan also focused on the same thing and blocked so many other people – from accomplishing it. It's just it's just fascinating to watch. You see all of these Hall of Famers, all of these stars go up against Michael Jordan and Michael Jordan just take them all down one by one year after year. And now we welcome back the director of The Last Dance, Jason Ayer. Now, Jason, uh, I always like to start these little sections with where you started the episode we're discussing. We're discussing episode eight. You started with BJ Armstrong. Now, this seems to be a Michigander. Theme. This just seems to be a theme that Michael Jordan will find any sort of slight, any sort of perceived slight, and turn that molehill into a mountain of disrespect to fuel him in his performance. What do you think the psychology is behind him doing that? Part of it is when you run out of opponents, you need to start conjuring them. Preach. Mm. That's dominance, Jacoby. More than greatness. That. Trying it's, to tell it's, you. It's the same way Jalen's old coach, Larry Legend, decided he was going to play a full game lefty one time because he wanted to rest mm. his right hand for the Lakers and scored 42. <laughs> These people who are on that level, they'll start making the game more difficult for themselves because they need to challenge themselves and keep themselves motivated. And by that time in Michael's career, how can you keep yourself motivated, you know, for, for an early, early round playoff game against the Charlotte Hornets. No disrespect to the Charlotte Hornets, but like he, he's got bigger, bigger things on his mind. So, so Michael had, had at that point really run out of people aside from a few who he could, uh, he, who could issue him challenges. So that's what he did. And also I think with BJ and to this day, they're very good friends. I think Michael, when he plays with somebody that is a family member to him, that's someone in his inner circle and he takes mm -hmm. great offense. He, he, he values loyalty to the utmost. And when someone's going to betray him like that, and he thought it was a betrayal that, that BJ screamed at the bench after hitting a shot like that. Um, he takes that personally. There's a kid named Lance Blanks. Jalen, you would know this guy. First round pick. With, for the Pistons. 
early in his Pistons career, first or second year was when the walk-off happened. And Michael used to play with Lance Blanks at Fred Whitfield's camp in Carolina every summer. So he knew him well. And when they got to that camp in the summer of 91, Lance came up to him and Michael had no time for him. Like you're friends with me and you're not going to come up and shake my hand. You're going to go, you're going to side with them and disrespect me like that. Wow. Loyalty is of the utmost. Concern. I didn't know that story, Jason. It's true. And I don't know how they are now. I assume they're fine now. Um, but at the time, I remember I said to Michael, do you remember a kid named Lance Blanks? And he lit up. Uh-huh. I do. And he knew he, he told me the story before I could even ask about it because he was on that walk off team. Um, Joe Dumars, I think, is the only guy on that team who didn't walk off. Sally may may have said something to to Michael, but don't Dumars didn't walk off. Um, the other guys did and Lance Blanks did and Michael took offense to it. So for BJ and again, they're fine now. Uh, but at the time, that's all Michael needed. You're going to light that match, then then. That's all Michael needs. Jordan might be the greatest basketball player of all time, but he's definitely the greatest grudge holder of all time. Like any sort of slight from 30 years ago, he's going to remember and you're going to pay for it until you apologize. Ask Charles people. Barkley. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's wild. He was just like, yo, the Bobcats struggling to put their squad together. MJ deleted his number and everything. <laughs> for 30 years. What's up with that, Jason? I had nothing to do with that. I heard I'm that blaming that, you. I thought, that, <laughs> yeah, Jesus. I thought that Kenny Smith brokered a, a a reconciliation between them. I didn't know about that. Well, we will see. I mean, I actually have a, a serious question for you regarding that. And you know, he holds grudges and he's hypersensitive to the way that he's spoken about and portrayed in the media. And here you are with the responsibility of making a documentary about his life, not just his career. Have you heard any feedback during this run from his? camp have you heard any criticisms from his people what has been michael jordan's response to the last dance i have no idea um and i don't say that derisively i don't that's know. a good thing we don't have that relationship and if we did then there'd be a problem with the making of the documentary i, I didn't get into this thing listen it's a thrill to interview michael jordan don't get me wrong but i didn't get into this thing to be friends with michael jordan nor should i have it would be irresponsible of me to do that so i think i did my job as well as i could do it i think he respected the job that i had to come in and do but it's not like we're on text. I do text with his son every once in a while. Marcus, um, we're friendly. Shout uh, Marcus. Great guy. And, it's, and, and, and also um, Jeffrey and Jasmine, we interviewed them as well. And, and I have a good relationship with them. I think that their family is so incredible in so many ways. And I've said that about his mom and everybody else. But I don't have that relationship with them. And, you know, honestly, like he's, he's not the audience for this thing. Well, I think the fact that you haven't gotten any notes back from him is good news in this sense, but you did get some notes during the editing yes, process and you got, you got some interesting notes about this particular episode in regards to the chronology of his returning to basketball and the double nickel game in MSG. What exactly did Michael air Jeffrey Jordan tell you about the chronology of his return to the NBA? This was right when we went into lockdown. So, um, I know that Michael saw bits and pieces of earlier episodes, but I think that he had a life to live and he was probably out golfing 36 holes a day and hanging out with his twin babies and, and just living retired life, doing what he's mm -hmm. doing for the, the Jordan brand and for the Hornets, whatever. So I don't think that the doc was at the forefront of his mind. When the quarantine went down in mid-March, all of us were locked down, including the Michael Jordans of the world. So he had time, ample time, for better or worse, to watch these rough cuts just like the rest of the partners had done for the entire process. So all of us back in the edit room were like, we're, we were at home actually at that point, but on the edit team, we're thinking like, what is this going to mean for, the pro what if he says, rip up these episodes? I don't want one, two, three, four, five, change it around, take this out, take this mm. out. So we got notes back on episode eight and um, it has like whose note it is. And it's, you know, John Dollars, JD, Connor Shell, CS. Shout, shout, Libby. Libby, guys. Um, and there's, there's a note, there's an MJ note, which is like, okay. He, <laughs> and when he came back from baseball, the first game was against Indi Indiana, in Indianapolis, and he was rusty. We cut from that just for time purposes. We cut right from that comeback game because we had to cover that game right mm -hmm. to the double nickel, famous 55-point game in Madison Square Garden. His note, he said, there was a game in between those in Atlanta when I hit a buzzer beater. So it go, was. Go check that out because that's yes. who I could be the old MJ was that night in Atlanta. So 
it's one thing to get that note from any executive would be a great note Ooh. to get it from the guy who's saying this i'm telling you this is when i knew i could be that guy it was it was a perfect note to get um he gave a similar note about the oakley yeah the oakley cartwright trade um earlier in the series he said that when we're talking about the jerry kraus beef like that was a big brick in that wall that he traded oakley away so we should in this prime we should touch on that yeah and, and he acknowledges in his interview um in defense of jerry kraus that that was the right move. But at the time, he was pissed off about it because that was his enforcer, defender on the court and his best friend off the court on the team. So that's the kind of notes that he was giving at that point. And then everybody from, from for eight, nine, and 10. I just watched today uh, the almost finished version of 10 and gave my own notes to the final audio mix and color correction. And then in a couple of days, so we're still not done with the, the series yet, but we will be, or we better be in about a week or else they're going to rip up my contract. Michael Jordan returned to basketball and did get eliminated. That's one of the things like mm. that kind of goes under the radar. Good point, Jay. Against Horace Grant, one of those people, unlike BJ Armstrong, that was able to close the deal. So why was losing to Shaq, Penny, Nick Anderson stole the ball from him? Why was that so important to the three-peat that ultimately took place? That's a great question. And it reminded me of something too. That's another note that he gave because me, I'm the director. I know it all. I'm going to tell the story I want to tell. I've studied this whole thing. I said, you know, I made the decision on the rough cut. Horace Grant wasn't that big a deal. Michael wasn't ready to come back. He was rusty. We can't spend a lot of time on Horace Grant because we got story to, to move on to. Michael said, no, I was pissed. That is what drove me that off season. Wow to lose to the Magic and to lose to Horace Grant like that. So, and my editors, they were right. Like, they're, they're, Ab Isofsky is one of our editors. He's, he's brilliant. And Chad Beck is our lead editor. Brilliant. They put that in. And these, I, on purpose, did I hired non-sports guys for this because I wanted them just to Smart. keep back on the story. Um, and they said that's an interesting story to them. So this is a good example of how it's a collaborative effort. I'm not always right with these things. So I said... We'll keep it out. Michael said, put it back in. They said, see, Jason, we were right, too. We're on Michael's team with this. We put that in. Tim Grover, who is, is one of the um, MVP interviews of this thing, his batting average and his sound bites was like through the roof. His interview was yeah, they were. captivating. Yep. He tells that story, and he gets choked up at saying, like, normally guys would take a month off, and Michael's saying, I'll see you tomorrow. That's Correct. how fired up he was. So you can make a good argument. Um, he was rusty. He knew it. He came back as number 45. And when Nick Anderson said 45 ain't 23, mm. that lit a fire. And you saw what he did. Just you got a glimpse Changed of it. Changed his number. You got a glimpse of it when he came back to 23. He couldn't sustain it for the entire series. The Bulls couldn't sustain it. Honestly, that, that, that team was in a bit of disarray. This is pre-Rodman, remember. Rodman was yep. maybe the most important X factor in that, that second three-peat. So he goes into that summer, and he's got Space Jam to do. But he needs to get himself back into shape, into playing shape. And he knows, as we've discovered in episodes five and six, that his game did his talking. There's no movies. There's no McDonald's. There's no Hanes. There's no Gatorade. There's no Nike without his game on the, on the floor. So he said, I got to get back in and, and get back to who MJ is. One of the things that I always focus on when it comes to professional basketball is not the professional basketball, it's the pickup games. And we saw a little bit of that with the Dream Team <laughs> last week, which is phenomenal. But I want to know, was there anything that was on the cutting room floor? Is there any stories from those Space Jam pickup games that you can share with us? The only thing that was on the floor was that um, it wasn't just NBA guy. George Clooney played in those games. Um, Joe Pickett, the director, played in some of those games. Joe Pickett takes credit for the Bulls signing Dennis Rodman because he says that, <laughs> that uh, he told Michael that summer that you guys should sign Dennis Rodman and that all of a sudden Michael met with Dennis that night at, at the Peninsula Hotel in, in Hollywood and, and whatever. The spot. Success has a thousand fathers, failure is an orphan. And Joe Pick is one of the dads, I guess. Um, <laughs> but there were, there were NBA guys there. There were non-NBA guys there, celebrities there. This was the place to be in America, pop culturally, in the summer of 95, was the Jordan Dome on the Warner Brothers lot. So um, what's most interesting to me, and, and, and the, 
the pickup game stuff, I agree with you, Jacoby, that like watching the Monte Carlo pickup game, we could have just done that as an episode. Just real those, talk. Those games. No real edits. talk. No edits. Just that angle. Yeah. We, I remember we ordered lunch one day and I just closed the door and me and a few guys from the staff, we just sat there and watched these games. Mm. Just watch them. Like not trying to break them down, not logging them, not subtitling them. Just let's just watch the best basketball that's ever been played. Let's just watch that for a while. Um, and it was the same with, there wasn't quite as much B-roll of the, of the Jordan Dome games, but um, Jawan, Jalen, you know what? I, I only knew this story later on. I like shirt off Jawan in the dock. <laughs> um, Billy D, what did you call him in, in, uh, in Fat Five? <laughs> Light skin Billy D? No question. Um, Never seen him without a haircut and a crease in his pants. I read And the problem with that footage, just so you know, he was playing basketball with Michael Jordan during the day. I was doing whatever I was doing, and then we was getting in and getting it in at night. The problem was he was hooping during the day, and I was. That, that, that's the problem. <laughs> it says a lot about your careers and approach. <laughs> he was staying at Michael's house that summer, though. I didn't know that. I, I read that later on that Jawan said that Michael invited him to come out to those games. Shout David Falk. Is that oh? Is that why? Because because he represented him. I just thought I love the 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 aspect of that story, which is that yeah, come out and play like. Come on out. He was scouting guys. He was mm -hmm. he was seeing these guys, how the games had evolved in the last two years and who the new guys were. BJ tells a great story um, about Latrell Sprewell. Michael, for some reason, was obsessed with Latrell when he was gone and just thought that this guy was such an athlete and reminded him of him so, in so many ways, his game. Mm. That he showed up to the Warriors facility and started playing pickup with these guys and schooled them because he wanted Sprewell to know that he could still be himself and he could still come back. There's so many of these little stories like that in that 18. Wow. For a person like this to finally open up to the world, but do it and use you as a vehicle. How does it feel when you are walking the tightrope of he's trusting me with intimate stories that took place versus you know what? That's a little too far. Maybe I shouldn't put that in the dock. You're saying, like, do I push if I feel like he's not giving me enough? And or if he gave you too much that you probably was like, you know, you kind of went hard on Horace Grant right there. No. Or never. on Jerry Krause right there. Never. That type of thing. Never. Never, because at the very least, my out, my outlook on this thing from the beginning was let's let's go as hard as we can in these rough cuts and then I'll fight the battles. And there's some hills I'll die on and sometimes I'll dig my heels in and, and kick and stomp and have a, a knockdown drag out brawl of which we had plenty uh, in the last two years with all of the partners. And I think that the show is better for it. I told you guys just earlier about how wrong I was about the, the Horace Grant story. So I was not always right with these things, but I will say there's nothing that we ever did not put in that we wanted to put in. And we said, well, that that's too hard. That's not going to go over too well. Never once and mm. never once anything that Rough. we put in that they say there's there's a couple of moments coming up in episodes nine and ten. And I'm sure you're going to ask me for, for previews of those that they push back on. And I fought them on and we they push back and forth and back and forth as recently as a couple of weeks ago. Mm. But ultimately, they decided that it's okay, fine, keep it in. Because there never once was, and I know this is, listen, conspiracy theories, people love them. And I'm sure people wanna believe like, oh, whatever, he had control over this thing. And this isn't a real documentary. It's not real journalism because Michael Jordan- Oh, it's real. <laughs> Trust me, I'm as telling a player, as somebody that's done a documentary, this is real. He, I, he, he got ice in that glass, that's, my, this is real. <laughs> my voice is, is too hoarse. From, from all of the, the talking and, and arguing that we've done in the last two years <laughs> to sit there and let someone say it's not a real story and real journalism and it's a puff piece and that it's promotional. Listen, just because the guy is the hero in a lot of the stories that we're telling doesn't mean that it's false. Mm. He won six titles in eight years. How do you Superman. want Superman. So, you know, and I think that we, we attacked, especially in these episodes, in episode six and some in episode five, we attacked the things that I wanted to attack. I remember when I first got the job, people saying like, well, you're not going to do the gambling stuff. What well, didn't he get suspended by David Stern? You're never going to go there. Didn't he get his dad killed? You're not going to ask him about that. We addressed everything I wanted to address and more with him. So 
Last week was the week of John Great. Michael Wozniak and the Shrug. And uh, this week, there's another bid player who I find fascinating. And that's a gentleman by the name of George, who is labeled as Michael Jordan's best friend. And if you were to ask me who's Michael Jordan's best friend, I might say Ahmad Rashad. I, m- I might say Charles Oakley. I mean, that's sort of like those are the relationships that are, are sort of like rumored to be close to Michael. But who is this guy, George, that is his best friend? And why did it say best friend on his uh, lower third? I didn't make that up. You think I put best friend on there and that got that made it all That's the way? I'm asking. That was a text. That was a direct text. This person, those words. That came from Michael would like to have him listed as this. So back in 1984, Michael Jordan gets drafted by the Chicago Bulls. He's never been to the city of Chicago before. He hops on a plane by himself and he gets off the plane and the car that's supposed to pick him up is not there. And he has nowhere to go. And this guy walks up to him and says, hey, aren't you Larry Jordan? <laughs> oh, no. And Michael says, no, that's my brother. I'm Michael Jordan. And he says, well, my name is George. Um, looks like you're looking for a ride. My guy didn't show up that I'm supposed to drive. I can take you wherever you want to go. Wow. So mm. he gets into George's limo. George drives him to the hotel where the training camp is, where he's staying. And he says, hey, uh, and they talk on the way there. And Mike, Michael tells him, I'm new in town. I don't know what I'm doing. He wants to, uh, to know a place to get his hair cut. And George tells him, um, there's this place down the road. I can take you there if you want. Mike isn't in a car yet. So this becomes his friend. This is in 1984. To this day, mm. Michael calls him his best friend. Michael's got a lot of close friends. And I'm, I'm, it's not up to me to, to, to say who's his best friend. But that, that, <laughs> that came from somebody else to, to label George like that. So... Um, I love that story. And George was, was awesome to us. He's a really, really fun guy. George has all the champagne campaign stories and he will never tell them in that why he, that is why he is truly Michael Jordan's best friend. Um, we always appreciate you taking the time, uh, late on these Sunday nights to join us after the last dance. That's your bedtime, Jacoby. The kids oh, are yeah. about to wake I'm up tired. and come in there in I'm a tired. minute. I'm tired. I'm tired. Can you tell? And we look forward to having you back next week after the final episode episode 10 i think i'll make you do an episode 11 like i feel like there's already an email <laughs> talking about, about to be a 20. episode 11 yeah. jason yeah. and 50 cent putting out more content than anybody <laughs> at this point hoodie on boost lace look at him what this, can you tell this, us about uh, next sunday's experience more episodes jason we're going past 10 a lot of people asking for it what are your thoughts um I don't have any comment on that. I will answer the question about next Sunday. So it, it's become fun now for us on the inside to try and predict like what's going to resonate with people. Cause I didn't know that John Michael Wozniak was going to be on t-shirts uh, <laughs> before last week. or that former Chicago resident could have, man, the messages. <laughs> oh, God, people are offended by that. And, and I told you he was going to become president by the end of the series. And, and he did in, in episode five. All facts. And you'll see him again. President Obama has not made his last appearance in this series. There's a moment at the end of nine with Jalen's old coach, Larry Legend, that I think is going to melt the internet. Mm. You hear that, Jacoby? Jacoby, I'm trying to get the the answer from our guest. Be quiet. What happens in the moment? (laughs) No. No, no, no. We can discuss it next week. Same time. No, it's not, it's not yeah. like the ratings are going to get better. You don't have to tease it. Like everyone's watching this. I got the regardless. tease. Tell tease, us what tease. happens. It's one of those moments that I never thought they would let us keep in. And it closes the show. Mm. Um, you also are going to get, listen, two of the best series of the 90s took place with that 98 Bulls team. The, of course, the six-game series against um, the Jazz in the finals in which mm-hmm. Michael hits the shot in 98. I don't yeah, think that was crazy. Away there. And we spend a solid, like, 10 minutes in episode 10 uh, on that game six because that game was crazy. That and, was. Shout out to my brother um, Howard Isley. Got a chance to play against those guys twice right. in, in the finals and lost both times. Boston we College a little war stories, but it didn't matter. Boston College's own Howard Isley. Um, yes, indeed. The access that they got by that point, the access that they were giving the camera crew for like before the games in the locker room, after the game, after the championship, you're going to see some people that show up in that locker room. Where you're like, I didn't know, you know, there's, there's a there's a certain heartthrob from the biggest movie on the planet at that time mm. uh, who all of a sudden shows up in the, in the Bulls locker room. Um, so it's fun stuff like that, but also examinations of those series. 
of Reggie shot in game four. Jalen Rose, you're going to see Jalen Rose not only on this screen next week, but also on the big screen in episode nine, recounting his memories of that series as well. And then the backstories are not done and arguably my favorite backstory and one of the most, two of the most impressive people I've ever met in my life in Steve Kerr and his mother. Um, I love Steve Kerr so much. That is my guy. And like his, I'm old and washed up and want to play for him. His mom is, is um, she is like, you know, Steve's answer to Dolores Jordan is Ann Kerr, his mom. And, and their family went through a tragedy as well, similar to Michael's. And so we saw this week um, that Michael popped him and, you know, Michael said, oh, I hit the smallest guy on the team. He certainly wasn't the, the least tough guy on the team. Steve Kerr might be the toughest guy of any of those bulls in the 90s. And you'll see why in, in episode nine. So there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, two of my favorite. I think that the final four episodes of this series is my, my favorite stretch of episodes. So I'm looking forward to people watching it. Thank you so much for joining us, Jason. Jalen, you mentioned it's past my bedtime, but I'm fired up. Every time I watch these, I just get excited. I want to play basketball right now, but they took the hoops down in New York City. I want to get some shots up right now. So excited about this, and I cannot believe that we are just seven days away from the final, the final installment of episodes of The Last Dance. I want to thank they you for joining us. Bring some more. We need eleven through some. twenty. We gotta do. We gotta do something. We need I'll do, eleven I'll, through I'll, twenty. Anything. It, I'll do. I, I'll do a whole hour of just Michael Jordan's favorite cigars. That's all. Even that. I'll just watch that. <laughs> I'll watch him or, play a round of or, golf. Whatever it takes. You ready for this? Or Michael Jordan's favorite casinos. I would love that. I, I'm here for all the Michael Jordan content that we can possibly get. Unfortunately, we are just one week away from the last 10th and final installment of The Last Dance. I want to thank Jason Hare for coming on like he does every week at 11 o'clock after the episode airs. I want to thank you for joining us. And, of course, people at home, thanks for watching the Jalen and Jacoby thank After Show you. presented by State Farm. <laughs> <laughs>